Uh, we're going to have two speakers this morning, and we're going to take questions at the end of both of, uh, both of those talks. So first of all, Darren Qualman is a longtime thinker, a civilization critic, and an avid observer of the big picture. I love big picture stuff too. He is currently working as a freelance researcher and has spent much of his last six years researching and writing a book on our global 21st century civilization. During that time, Darren also returned to university, obtained two additional degrees, Bachelor of Science in Biology and in History. He also has a BA in Political Science. From 1996 to 2010, Darren was a top staff person and primary researcher and writer for the National Farmers Union, and I've worked with him on those on that organization, Canadian Organization for Farm Families. His work focuses on agriculture, energy, climate change, and the environment, the economy, and international trade. He's a member of the board of directors of the ETC Group. And I will introduce Blaine as well. And when we set this uh, day up, we were hoping that uh, Darren would do sort of the big picture principles, and then Blaine is a farmer and would say whether this is all BS or not, or whether it works. <laughs> Blaine is a certified holistic management educator and practitioner. As a former grain farmer, he struggled with the contra contradictions of industrial agriculture until he discovered holistic grazing management. As a part of the Soil Carbon Coalition, Blaine now uses regenerative agriculture methods to build soil organic matter, successfully sequestering up to 22 tons of carbon per acre on his livestock farm near Redverse, Saskatchewan. Blaine has figured out how to work with nature to capture solar energy for a large portion of the year to optimize water and mineral cycles and to grow nutrient-dense food. So Darren, please. Thank you, Gary. Uh, thank you for that introduction. And uh, thanks to all of you for coming out. Uh, my talk is called The End of uh, High Input, High Cost, High Emission Agriculture. And I put a little question mark in brackets. Uh, to some extent, it's a question, you know, are we nearing the end of uh, high input, high cost, high emission agriculture? Do we need to uh, come to the end of that? Uh, is climate change forcing us toward the end of that? Uh, so I'm going to just talk about what I call high cost, high input, high emission agriculture and then look at some of the alternatives as well. So uh, I've got four goals for my talk. The first is to uh, take a look at the real sources of greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture. The second is to show how low input and organic agriculture are solutions to our emissions problems. Third, to show how low input and organic agriculture are solutions to our income problems as well as our emissions problems. And then to talk about how we can uh, reduce emissions from our farms. So I'm going to start by pointing out something, uh, something important. This is a historic year, 2018. Uh, 2018 marks an important centennial. And uh, that centennial is 2018 marks the 100th anniversary of the beginning of the transition to high input agriculture. And the graph that you see on the screen there is a graph of uh, tractor numbers in Canada and horse numbers in Canada. And the time frame is 1910 to 1980. So there's about 70 years of data on there. Uh, the blue line that goes upward is the number of tractors. The brown line that goes downward is the number of horses. Uh, again, starts in 1910. And I've marked in red uh, the year 1918. And if you can't see that from the back, that's the year that the number of tractors starts to inflect upward. Uh, before 1918, the number of tractors, uh, the trend line was fairly flat, and then it inflects upward after 1918. And it, it's not the case that there weren't tractors before 1918. There were. But they tended to be the very large, heavy, expensive steam tractors that were burning coal or wood or sometimes straw. And those tractors uh, certainly did some work on the prairies. They broke some of the, the sod and they spun the, the threshing machines in the fall. But they were just too big and heavy and expensive for the average farm that maybe had uh, a quarter section or two. Uh, so most farms didn't have one and there just weren't many tractors uh, before this, the First World War. 
But in 1918, three factors came together to change all that. First, uh, during the war, a lot of industrial factory capacity was created. They created factories that could produce uh, steel machinery and engines. And uh, they, they had a lot of industrial capacity coming out of the First World War. Second, the war created a farm labor shortage. So they were looking for ways to produce <coughs> food, uh, even though they didn't really have enough people to run all the horses and run all the farms. But third and perhaps most important, uh, 1917, 1918, a whole new kind of tractor came on the stage. Uh, smaller, lighter, uh, more affordable internal combustion engine tractors. Uh, the Ford Fordson was one of the first. The F John Deere Model D, uh, McC McCormick Deering uh, Farm All. So really farmers could, for the first time, afford tractors on their small and medium sized farms. So that's the data for Canada. Uh, it wasn't just happening in Canada. That's the data for the United States. And if you can't see it from the back, uh, 1918, the same thing happened. There's a flat trend line for tractors, and then it kicks up sharply uh, in 1918. And the number of horses shortly after that peaks and begins to decline. Now, why is this important, and what does this have to do with emissions? Well, I would argue that this is the beginning of the high input era. When farmers started buying tractors for the first time in history, they became dependent on every year purchasing farm inputs, and in this case, it was petroleum. And, and this is a real historic break. Uh, before 1918, virtually everything that went into farming came out of farming. Farms were largely self-sufficient. Seeds moved in circles, fertility moved in circles, uh, the energy for doing work moved in circles, the energy supply for doing field work uh, came from farm fields. After 1918, the energy for doing farm work increasingly came from distant oil fields. So here you see the dawning of the age of uh, high input agriculture. Uh, I'm just going to come at this one additional way. Uh, that is the uh, farmyard that I live on south of Saskatoon. And I put this up because I think that barn is really symbolic. That barn uh, was one of the last big horse barns finished in Western Canada. It was finished right in 1918, and I think you'll see the bad timing that the owner had. Uh, he was Mr. Rystrom. I, I knew his son uh, when I was young. And Mr. Rystrom wanted to farm a lot of land, so he needed pulling power, so he needed a big barn to house all those horses, so he built this. Got it finished in 1918, just for the, in time for the end of the horse era. And uh, he had two cases of bad luck. He finished the barn in 1918, and then he himself uh, died in the flu epidemic of 1918 that followed the, the First World War. So uh, a real case of bad timing. But, but I put this up because I think that that barn symbolizes the tail end of a very, very long period of low input, solar powered, low emission agriculture. And I think those solar panels, uh, we put those up here in half ago, I think solar panel rays like that one, and uh, some of you might have these on your farm, but solar panel rays like that one symbolize at least the possibility of a new era of low input, solar powered, low emission agriculture. So ju just to sort of make explicit what a lot of you already know, uh, over the last hundred years, uh, farmers have become increasingly dependent on a whole range of purchased inputs. Uh, at the end of the First World War, it was petroleum for pulling power. After the Second World War, it was fertilizers made uh, from fossil fuels or with fossil fuels. Uh, shortly after that, farmers started using more and more petrochemical insecticides and herbicides. And then most recently, uh, farmers have become more and more dependent upon purchasing high-tech seeds, plastic antibiotics, uh, feed additives, and a whole range of inputs. So the really, the last hundred years has been one of ever-increasing dependence on purchased farm inputs. So I, I promised a, a big picture look at this, and, and here, here's the big picture. These high dependencies on purchased farm inputs, <coughs> that's not normal. Uh, in no way is that normal. It's actually a real historical anomaly. Farmers have, have practiced agriculture for 10,000 years. That's 100 centuries. And for 99 centuries, agriculture was low input, solar powered, and low emission, zero net emission. It's just for one century, just for 1% of the time, 
that we have practiced agriculture, that it has been high input, fossil fueled, and high emission. Uh, and, and when I talk about high emission, uh, I, I know a lot of you are organic, but uh, a lot of your neighbors using nitrogen fertilizer, and, and we just don't realize or we forget just how much fossil fuel goes into nitrogen. Uh, if, if you went to a, a nitrogen fertilizer factory, uh, I got a picture one here. I took this on the way into town a couple of days ago. That's the Coke Industries plant, uh, less than a kilometer from here. Uh, if you went to that factory, you'd see big natural gas pipelines going in and uh, big nitrogen gas uh, and hydrous ammonia pipe coming out the other side. Uh, nitrogen is really a, a natural gas product. I've, well, I've read the annual reports of the big fertilizer companies and they say 80 to 90 percent of their cost of making nitrogen is their cost of gas. And the energy in one ton of nitrogen fertilizer is equivalent to two tons of gasoline. So it, it, it is a way that we push fossil fuel calories from the ground into, into the food system in order to push out food calories out the other end. Uh, not only is, is nitrogen a fossil fuel product, uh, very energy intensive, we're using more and more of it all the time. This is data for Manitoba, and it covers the period 1968 uh, until 2016, so what is that, about uh, 40 some years? Just about 50 years. Uh, and you can see the upward trend line. In Manitoba, farmers here have doubled the use of nitrogen since 1989. And, and the trend line is still sharply upward. It looks like it's going to double again. Uh, in Saskatchewan, it's actually faster than that. In Saskatchewan, farmers have doubled their tonnage of nitrogen just since 1996, uh, just during the, the zero-till era. So I, I often hear that uh, <coughs> zero-till agriculture reduces input use. Um, can't see it. Uh, again, that's the Koch Brothers factory there. Um, so as I said, increasingly agriculture is a way of turning fossil fuel calories from the ground into food calories on our plates. Uh, less so for organic producers, but it, it's still an issue for you. And a side effect of pushing all of those fossil fuel calories into one end of our food system is that we push a lot of emissions out the other end. And, I'm getting now to the, the, what I said at the beginning, but the real, <coughs> excuse me, the real sources of our agricultural emissions. As I said, I, uh, humans have practiced agriculture for 10,000 years, 100 centuries, and, and for 99 centuries it was solar powered, low emission. And it's just for this last century that we've tried this new experiment in uh, high input, high energy use, fossil fueled, high emission agriculture. So. My main point is agriculture does not produce greenhouse gas emissions. Agricultural inputs produce greenhouse gas emissions. And therefore, any low emission agricultural system will be uh, a low input agricultural system. The high input system that we've built and that we've really doubled down on in the last generation isn't ever gonna be a low input system. Uh, so the solution is low input on organic <coughs> agriculture, it is a solution to our emissions problems, and it is also a solution to our income problems. And I just want to take a little look at Manitoba farm income here, because I think it, it illustrates my point. Uh, this is a graph of Manitoba farm income over the last 90 years, uh, from 1926 to 2016, and you can see on uh, on the far side over there, you can see the Great Depression. Uh, I should say that the numbers here are adjusted for inflation, so that upward trend in the gross revenue line, the top line is gross revenue, <clears throat> that upward trend isn't just inflation, that's actual increase in, in output and value. And then the bottom line, the gray line, that is uh, net farm income. And I'll just add some color so this is a little easier to see. Uh, that red line, that's zero. So you can see net farm income, that bottom line, uh, touches zero and goes below. But I'll just add a little bit more color here. Uh, the, the green areas, the green shaded areas, that, those are times when farmers' net incomes were positive over the last 90 years, and the, the red areas are times when they were negative. But I just want to add a little bit more color here. And that's this blue area. The difference between gross revenues and net income 
And that blue area represents the amount of money taken off of Manitoba farms by input suppliers, by banks and service providers, but mostly by fertilizer companies, machinery companies, uh, fuel sellers, seed sellers, chemical companies, etc. And you can see that that blue area just gets wider and wider and wider as we go into the high input era of agriculture. And I'll, I'll just put some numbers to this so you can see. Uh, from about the end of the Great Depression until the late 70s, if you were farming in Manitoba, if you made a dollar selling your crops and livestock, you got to keep about 44 cents. Through the 80s until now, that's four cents. Four cents out of every dollar. Uh, the input corporations are taking 96 cents out of every dollar. And uh, now I should say these numbers have farm subsidies taken out because farm subsidies can sometimes mask what's happening. The government subsidies are netted out. So net income's a little bit higher than what's shown here and gross revenues are a bit higher too. <coughs> but uh, we've taken those out so they don't mask what's really happening in the markets. So of the non-subsidy dollars that your farm makes, you're only keeping about 4%. If you're a conventional farmer, you're probably keeping more if you're organic. Um, the high input era has been bad for the climate, bad for uh, the uh, emissions, but it's been really, really bad for family farmers. Uh, nearly a third of Canadian farmers have been pushed off the land in the last generation since 91. Two thirds of young farmers have been pushed off the land uh, in Manitoba, in 1991, you had 7,200 farmers under the age of 35, 7,200. Now you've got 2,200. In a single generation, the number of young farmers in Manitoba has been reduced by two-thirds. So uh, high input agriculture just hasn't been good for family farmers. Uh, record high debt of $100 billion. Uh, farm income crisis, it's waned a little bit right now, but uh, could reassert itself. And uh, since 1985, in order to keep this high input model going, Canadian taxpayers have had to transfer to farmers $100 billion in farm support payments. So the reason I'm talking about farm income is because often farmers feel threatened by climate change and the idea that farmers are going to have to retool their farms, change their practices, invest, <coughs> do things differently. Uh, maybe incur some costs. Farmers feel threatened by the project of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. But I don't think they should because minimizing <coughs> greenhouse gas emissions means minimizing purchased inputs. Uh, and that opens the opportunity to really rescue Canadian agriculture from the people that are controlling it, the agribusiness corporations, the people that sell those inputs, and rescue it from the people that are extracting 96% of the farm wealth generated by farmers. So. Uh, we have a chance to fix the farm income problem. Uh, we have a chance to stop the loss of farm families. And the crisis that is created by climate change and the need to reduce emissions gives us an opportunity to change the trend lines around agriculture and, and do the kind of things uh, in agriculture that we want to do. So the question is, what can farmers and, and organic farmers do to lower their emissions? And uh, before I answer that, I just want to touch very briefly on why it is so very critical that, that we do need to lower emissions, not just in agriculture, but in every part of our economy. Uh, this is a graph some of you may have seen. This is the last 800,000 years of CO2, uh, CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere. And, and I won't go into it in detail, but you can see for 800,000 years it oscillates and then it spikes up dramatically. I've, I've marked. Uh, 1800 and 1900 on there. Uh, in 1900, we were still below 300 parts per million. Now we're at 400. We're almost certainly going to top out over 500. And unless we do something in agriculture, in the energy sector, in transport, in every part of our economy, we're going to go past 600. And no one's going to be hurt more than farmers if, if we allow that to happen. So there's a critical need to reduce emissions, not just from agriculture, but from every part of our economy. Uh, this is a, another greenhouse gas, methane. Uh, the time frame isn't as long here. This is only uh, 10,000 years. But you can see methane concentrations in the atmosphere since the last ice age were more or less flat and stable. And then in 1800, they spiked upward, and they've actually tripled. Uh, and th this is a very powerful greenhouse gas, 
28 times more powerful than CO2, and we've tripled the concentrations in the last two centuries uh, as a result of coal mining, uh, oil and gas production, rice paddy agriculture, cattle production, and other things. So these trend lines are very disturbing, and, and we need to we need to curb this and start bringing these concentrations down. So. Uh, in order to understand what farmers can do to cut their emissions, we need to know where those emissions come from. And this is a graph of Manitoba agricultural emissions over the last 25 years, 1990 to 2015. And uh, there's a lot of different kinds of emissions here, but I, I color-coded them so you can kind of see the three main areas of uh, greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture. The blue at the bottom is nitrogen fertilizer. The dark blue is the nitrous oxide coming off of the <coughs> land if you use a lot of nitrogen fertilizer. Uh, the lighter blue above it is the CO2 that comes from the nitrogen fertilizer factories like that Coke uh, Industries factory I showed you at the beginning. Uh, you can see that nitrogen really is the biggest contributor to Manitoba greenhouse gas emissions and you can see that it's going up. You, you, I showed you the graph that had uh, nitrogen fertilizer going up well, emissions from nitrogen fertilizer use are going up as well. Uh, we'll skip over the tan color band. The red is energy use on your farms. Uh, that's the uh, natural gas to heat water in buildings, diesel fuel, gasoline, uh, the, the energy using your machinery in your buildings. And if you're not from Manitoba, it's also the emissions from the electricity that you use on your farm, if you're from Saskatchewan or Alberta and Manitoba, there aren't really emissions from that electricity because it's largely hydroelectric. Uh, so those are the red, that's the energy use on your farm, and then the green on top is uh, largely livestock and methane, the, the light green is uh, emissions from manure, and the dark green is uh, enteric emissions from cattle, uh, the, the, the methane that comes out when they digest grass. Um, just in terms of what you can actually do on your farm to uh, reduce emissions, the, the, the key thing that everybody in Canada, North America, and around the world is going to have to look at is minimizing nitrogen fertilizer use. Nitrogen fertilizer use is the biggest contributor to greenhouse gases from agriculture. I put a check mark beside that one because if you're organic, you've already done that. And I think everybody who's not organic is going to have to learn the, the, the techniques that organic farmers have for generating nitrogen in their soils without <coughs> purchasing nitrogen from factories. But uh, if you're not organic and you're using nitrogen, it, there's probably going to be a lot less of it used in the future. Uh, the first step's going to be nitrogen efficiency, but after that, there's actually going to have to be uh, a very, very concerted effort just to reduce tonnage. Uh, the second thing is minimizing other purchased inputs. It's not just nitrogen, it's just most of the inputs we use on our farms are petroleum derived or very energy costly, energy intensive, and they have a lot of emissions associated with them. So any system that reduces inputs, any, any technique you can find to replace an input is something that's going to reduce the emissions from your operation. Uh, the third thing is ensure your electricity supply is low emission. Again, in Manitoba it's not as much of an issue because hydroelectric dams have, there's problems with hydroelectric dams in, in terms of the environment but emissions aren't one of the problems you have with hydroelectric dams. But if you're in Alberta or Saskatchewan, you might want to look at uh, finding a way to provide the electricity for your farm operation uh, from solar panels or some other source that has low emissions. Um, wherever possible, replace small engines and other, other combustion sources with electricity, because electricity can be zero emission. And uh, the last thing I would say is keep an open mind. Uh, we're going to start seeing electric tractors and electric light trucks offered up. And uh, I know it's a little bit difficult to imagine uh, farming with electric tractors, but there's really a lot of research already done. And a lot of the components that are on the shelf that are going into electric cars like Tesla right now could actually be scaled up and, and electric tractors could be on the on offering, at least for the small and mid-sized tractors <coughs> in the very near future. And I, I showed you that barn. Well, that barn represented low input <coughs> solar powered pulling power for a farm. And uh, if we can somehow find a way to make uh, electric tractors or maybe even hydrogen tractors work, we might be able to get to a place where our pulling power on our farms is uh, zero emission again. So I'm running out of time. I'll just conclude 
uh, by saying that, that we're in the opening stages of real transformation. Uh, we've gone through transformations before, so we shouldn't be too concerned about this. Uh, the first half of the 20th century was a massive transformation. In the first half of the 20th century, we took a millennial, a millennia old mm. agricultural system that was low input and solar powered and zero net emission and we replaced it with a high input, fossil fueled, high emission system. That was the transformation in the first half of the 20th century. In the first half of the 21st century, we're largely going to have to do the reverse. We're going to have to find a replacement for this fossil fueled high emission agricultural system we've built over the last hundred years. So that's my talk. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, just sorry. Okay. I had one more point. Uh, I just want to. Uh, you don't have to copy down my contact information. Uh, you can come come to me. I'll give you a business card. Uh, I just want to thank the National Farmers Union. Uh, the National Farmers Union has really been taking a leadership role in in looking at agriculture and energy and uh, and emissions, and they've worked with me. And I'm going to continue to work with them. Uh, they've, uh, they've provided some funding for some studies. And uh, if you're not a member of the National Farmers Union, consider joining. I think they're going to come up with some really good reports on a new vision of low emission agriculture moving forward. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. So uh, I farm in southeastern Saskatchewan. and. Uh, first 20 so odd years of my farming career I was pretty high tech and uh, I guess I had somewhat of a passion for soil health and I realized back then that that was not going to work and so I've always been a pretty voracious reader and I was starting to read things from Savory and and uh, Boisson and some of these people some of the very early pioneers about a more sustainable or regenerative type system of agriculture. So I started buying preceding grass and putting uh, putting cows on it. And uh, along the way, I've learned a few things. So there's a picture of me moving cows. It's a really tough job. It takes about five minutes a day. And Darren just told me that they they uh, create methane. I don't disagree with that. But uh, most of the data is coming from feedlots. When we run animals and systems like this, the methane is pretty limited. And also, no researchers, to my knowledge, in this part of the world have ever studied mesanthropic bacteria. And that's key when you get a healthy soil. Mesanthropic bacteria take the, the methane and put it directly back into the soil. There's quite a bit of work in Australia done on that. I've actually measured it on my farm and using the same information that Darren did for every one kilogram of methane going up, I put 17 down. So, <coughs> when we're going to talk about climate, this is number one, the Keeling curve. Dr. Keeling started measuring climate back, or CO2 back in 1958 at that time. There was 312 parts per million in the, in the atmosphere. And as Darren just talked about, it continues to go up. On January the 20th of this year, we're at 408, and it's going to keep going up. If we stop burning fossil fuel tomorrow, it will continue to go up. So we have to reverse the process. All of the climate talks, all of the political meetings have done absolutely zero at this point. We've been talking about this for 40 years, and nothing has happened yet. And so we can't sit around and wait for some political leader to say, hey, this is the answer. The only way we will change it is to do it ourselves. It's movements like this that will change it. So there's three basic types of agriculture that I want to talk about. And the graph there on the, the, the vertical axis is, is the percentage of organic matter in the soil. The horizontal axis is time. So there's the destructive model where you can see organic matter levels decrease. There's a so-called sustainable model where it stays the same. And then there's the regenerative model where we're actually building organic matter. Unfortunately, when I drive across the prairies, I observe mainly destructive agriculture yet today. And Darren showed us a few minutes ago the increase in nitrogen fertilizer. Part of the reason why we are using more and more nitrogen fertilizer is to mask the effect that we are losing organic matter in our soils. They continue to go down. And so it's a vicious cycle. We lose organic matter, and so we have to buy more nitrogen fertilizer to make up the yield. 
So everyone wants to be sustainable. I would suggest let's go one more step and let's become regenerative in our approach. Let's start to rebuild and it's relatively easy to do. So just to illustrate the destructive force of agriculture, there's just a few pictures all taken within 100 miles of this spot in the last 10 years and you can see what I mean. You saw Jay Fear this morning, he showed a few pictures of destructive agriculture also. And if we look at the worldwide statistics, each one of us eats about half a ton of food a year, roughly. We eat a little more than that here, but worldwide it's half a ton. And in the process of producing that half ton, 10 tons of soil are lost off the planet's agricultural areas. So 10 tons, that doesn't seem like that big a deal, but there's 7.5 billion of us. So 7.5 billion times 10 tons works out to 75 billion tons of soil is lost off the planet every single year in the production of food. And I would submit we cannot continue to live as a civilization if we keep on going down this path. Our grandchildren will have no future. So just another look at that, 10,000 years ago our ancestors settled down and started to, instead of chasing food, they thought it was easier to grow it. And at that time, there's just a little over 13 billion hectares of functioning ecosystem on the planet of the dry land. So at that time, there was about 8 billion hectares of forest and 5 billion hectares of rangeland. And so civilization as we know it started in the, in the Tigris-Euphrates Valley, present-day Iraq, Iran. And that's where civilization, the so-called Western civilization, began. And it's been a phenomenal success story. The population at that time was about a million people. Today we're seven and a half billion. That's pretty phenomenal. But there's been a few costs along the way. So when we look at where we're at today, we now have three and a half billion hectares of forest from eight billion. We have four billion hectares of rangeland, so we went down slightly. We have now created a new category called 1.5 billion hectares of cropland, and one more new category called four billion hectares of desert. So that's a pretty, pretty interesting number. That's just about 30% of the land mass we have desertified by the process of agriculture. And if you fly over the Middle East today and take a look down, you don't see green, you don't see a fertile crescent, you see a brown color. The carbon has been totally farmed out. Afghanistan, Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, Iran, brown. Let's look at the United States. California, New Mexico, Arizona, West Texas, brown. Look at the continent of Australia, brown. So in the process of agriculture, we've simplified the systems and we farm the carbon out. And we're on a downward spiral and we're desperately trying to mask it with our so-called technology, but I'm not sure it's working as Darren just pointed out very, very wonderfully. So we need to rebuild this system. The other thing that's happening is this is data from McCants and Widdowson, who are probably the most authoritarian people on nutrient density in the world. They're from England, and they've been studying nutrient density of food for since the early 40s. And you can see there that, you know, if I look at vegetables as an example, from, from 1940 to 1991, if I look at the purple one, which is magnesium, overall in the UK, 24% less magnesium in the vegetables. If we look at fruit, it's 16%, meat is 15 dairy is 1%. If we go down to iron, set 27, 24, 50, and 83. And that's the same trend in all food types with all minerals. And the reason that we eat is to get mineral nutrition. We need 33 essential elements in this body every single day to maintain health. And so all of a sudden I'm eating food that's less than nutrient dense, and I might be fine for today, probably be good for tomorrow, even probably one more year, two more years. But when you get to be my age, all of a sudden, all sorts of funny things start to happen. You get Alzheimer's, you get prostate cancer. You know, we look at our kids, we see epidemic rates of AHD. We see diabetes going through the roof. We see obesity happening. And we put blame at all kinds of different things, chemicals, sedentary lifestyle, but I believe a lot of it is the fact that the food that we are producing on our farms is not nearly as nutrient dense as it used to be. And we need to fix this problem. It's a serious problem. 
So what is soil health? This is a definition by Blaine. And so basically it means that it's got to be covered in litter. Jay Fear talked about that quite a bit. He called it armor, but it's the same thing. We need to have functioning biology supplying nutrients to the plants. We have to have the organic matter increasing. Sustaining, in my mind, is not good enough. We have to be regenerating. And we have to be producing nutrient-dense food. And we only can produce nutrient-dense food if we have active bugs working in the soil. It won't happen any other way. So we have to have root exudates going down into the, into the soil for long periods of time, and we need to have animals on the landscape. So if you're a strictly grain farmer, you need to really rethink that one. You don't need to own animals, but you need to figure out how to get them onto your farm once in a while. So what builds soil health? Photosynthesis does it, litter does it, root, root exudates is the next step. That feeds the soil life. And then coming off of that soil life are slimes, snots, glues, all sorts of wonderful things come off the fungi and the bacteria working down there. And that's what actually glues the aggregates together and starts to make less dense soil. And so as we start to get soil that's less dense, all sorts of wonderful things happen. Roots can go deeper, air goes in and out, water goes in and out much better. Life just gets better and better and better as we get soil that's less dense. So we need to have those bugs working. We've got to feed the bugs to get them to work, to create the glues, to create the soil aggregation. That's how the process works. So this particular picture is a, an interesting story. When I went through college a long time ago, I was told that it takes 10,000 years, or 1,000 years, I think it is, to make one inch of soil. So down below that green bar there, that soil was that color right to the top 18 years ago. So this guy sowed grass on that piece of land and started to manage the grazing on it. And there's 11 inches of black dirt there now in 18 years. So the point is that we can regenerate badly degraded soils relatively quickly when we change our management. The key word there is change. That's the word we have a lot of problem with as a society, is how do we change? So it goes quick. The other thing that we need to really remember is that carbon is a phenomenal sponge. So every gram of carbon we can put into that soil will hold 18 or 8 grams of water. So you want to do some math, take 4,700 tons as the kind of 30 centimeter deep of a hectare of soil, do your math and you figure out how much water that will hold and it just blows your mind. And we've spent millions of dollars in the last 10 wet years draining soils putting in ditches and tile lines and so on. And I would submit that if we had healthy, functioning, high carbon soils, a good lot of that drainage would not be necessary because the soil would be resilient enough to hold that water. And now when we go into, if we're going into a drier cycle again, who knows what's going to happen, we want to have more water holding capacity, not less. So some basic principles to regenerate. We've got to minimize or better yet stop tillage. So really think about your tillage operations. Do you have to do it? Is there another way? Never leave bare soil. Keep it covered. Keep it green longer. We've got to have diversity. This monoculture thing is absolute crap. And we need to figure out how to integrate crops and soils to get more diversity onto the land. <clears throat> so those are the basic principles. The principles never vary. How each one of us does it on our own farms will be hugely varied. And that's, that's the beauty, beautiful part of this is that we're all unique and we all take those principles and try and figure out how to do it. There's no right or wrong. So basically we need to capture the energy, that's our, our source, and there's only three things we can do. We can keep the leaves, we can put, if I have a leaf here and a leaf here, I can put another one in between, I'm going to capture more energy. If I have a leaf this wide and another leaf this wide, if I make them this wide, I'm going to capture more energy. But the biggest gain of all is time. And you think about a, wheat, a crop of wheat or canola, it's green 70 days of the year. The rest of the year it's not doing anything. And if we're not putting exit it down into the soil, our soil health is going backwards. We have the potential in our cold climates to capture energy for some, somewhere between 220 to 250 days of the year. So if we're only doing annual crops, we've got a heck of a lot of energy we're wasting. And so I'll just show you this picture here. 
this is I think December 16th and you can see those cows grazing and look at how green that grass is yet and so it didn't do a lot of photosynthesizing on December the 16th maybe for an hour but you actually go down in there there's a little microclimate created and maybe at two o'clock in the afternoon between two and three you actually take your thermometer and measure it you can take a bricks tester and you can actually check and you can prove to yourself you're making sugar and that's going down and feeding that's keeping those microbes working, building soil. That's the name of the game. And that's why these cover crops are so important in, in annual cropping systems. So just another little shot on light here. This is just my home section of land, township around it. And when you, when you look at it in a bar graph, I was curious to see if I was actually capturing more light than, than anyone else. And it proves that over 12, I think that's 12 years of data there. You can see every single year I captured more light than the neighbors in the township around me. Water drop hitting bare soil, the single most destructive force in the air on, on the planet, causes more damage than any other natural phenomenon. And all we have to do is keep the land covered like that. And that solves that problem. And so one of the things that croppers really need to do is they need to get that through their head that there is ways of running seeding systems that will maintain true no-till systems. And when you have your land looking like that, you can have a three or four inch rain, and guess what? That, so that water will enter the soil. It will not run down that gully behind the drill there and, and cause major washouts. So that's critical. We have to keep that land covered. So these are all the bugs and good gollywogs that live down under there. So up in the top, we have the sun shining, green leaves, creates sugar, sends, goes down into the roots, called root exodus. Most plants, somewhere between 30, 40, 50 percent of that sugar actually leaks out into the rhizosphere, the, the area immediately around the root hair, and that is sugar or food for the bacteria and the fungi. And you may say, well, what a wasteful way of doing it. Well, when you think about it, Mother Nature was elegant in how she designed the system. 98 percent of the elements, the 33 elements that I need in my body, are tied up tightly. They're totally 100% unavailable for plants. And you say, well, that's kind of dumb. But you think about it, if they were water soluble, they would have washed out to the ocean centuries ago and there would be absolutely no fertility. There'd be no life on the dry land. So it's tied up tightly. The only way it can be released is with microorganisms. So the plants figured that out. In fact, the fossil record shows us that the fungi and the bacteria came onto the land before the plants. Once they got going on the land, then the plants came onto the land. So we have to have that process of plants feeding bugs, bugs release the nutrients, give it back to the plants. That's how we have nutrient dense food. That's an important one there. Mycorrhizorial fungi, hyphae. Dr. Walter Jenny in Australia, he's done a lot of work on these things. And his research shows that in a cubic meter of soil, a box, something like this, he has mapped up to 250,000 kilometers of hyphae in one cubic meter of healthy soil. Now just think about that, 250,000 kilometers. So the amount of life under what we stand on is phenomenal. And when we could get it all working for us, life just gets better and better and better. Just another picture of roots. And we tend to think of the rooting zone as something like this. The rooting zone should be 10 meters. Trees go down 30 and 40 meters. So there's a phenomenal amount of earth and glacial till down there that's full of nutrition and so on that we haven't even come close to tap tapping yet. So we just got to get everything working and these roots go down and do an awful lot of work. So the, so the last thing then is, is the, the concept of diversity. When we have no diversity, things are really simple, extremely unstable. And so if I was a businessman looking at a wonderful model, I'd want to encourage monoculture because it takes billions of dollars a year to support this unnatural monoculture. In fact, we have monoculture so bad where I live that if I'm a wheat farmer and there's five wild oats left after, se after spraying season, that will be coffee shop talk in Red versus Saskatchewan. I can guarantee it. That's how bad we worship the God of monoculture. And we have to get away from that. We've got to move to the right. We've got to figure out how to grow more crops together. This is diversity. People on the land is diversity. We need more people on the land, not less. 
This is peas and canola together, some research done at Moleta. You can see peas and canola on the left, and any combination thereof yields more. You know, there's synergy. There's synergy between plants that we don't understand. So this little joke just kind of says, well, what if we don't change at all and something magical just happens? And I think that's kind of, to me, it kind of represents society, you know, that sales are going down, profits are going down, but man, if we don't do anything, it should just happen someday and we'll become profitable and rich and famous. The key word here again is change. And none of us like that. We're not comfortable with that. But it works. And there's lots of resources out there to help us along the journey. So, when we look at the bigger picture now, and look at climate, it's all the same. The reason the climate is out of whack is because agriculture is out of whack. I showed you earlier four billion hectares of desert. I think every one of you knows that bare land gets hotter in the summer than, than land that's transpiring, growing stuff. It's only common sense. And so you think about that, that has a massive change in the climate of the earth and how much heat is absorbed by the soil. Transpiration is a cooling effect. You lose about 80 watts per square meter with transpiration. So when we look at the earth in, in total, there's 342 watts come in every day, every single day, and 339 are re-radiated re back out. So we're out by one lousy percent. That's our heat imbalance. That's all it is, one percent. So all we have to do then is ramp up our transpiration, keep it greener longer by one percent, and we've solved that heat balance problem. That's how simple it is. Now we've got to do it in the worldwide scale, which isn't quite so simple, but I can't worry about Afghanistan. I can't do anything about Afghanistan, but I can do something about my farm. So that's the name of the game. And that's what regenerative agriculture is all about, is to make our farms healthy. And when we start doing that, we actually are solving. We're taking carbon from up here, the CO2 levels I showed you, and we're keeping our surfaces cooler. So just to share a couple of results there, uh, on my particular operation, we've measured carbon for, for a while. In 2011, we had 221 tons. and 14, we had 239, so we increased six tons per year. Change it to uh, CO2 is what everyone likes to talk about. So that's 22.88 tons of CO2 per hectare per year. So if um, Alberta is currently taxing at the rate of $30 a ton, so they're trying to get people to use less fossil fuels by taxation, which whether that's right or not, I'm not sure. But at that rate, what I'm putting in the ground is worth $274 an acre per year. That's the goods and services that I'm doing to society for free. And I guess what, I, what I'm saying is that if we want to fix this problem and we want to implement effect change rapidly across society, what you do is you pay farmers to regenerate agriculture. And one of the ways to do that is to pay them to sequester carbon. And I can guarantee that if, if every farmer knew that I was getting $274 an acre a year in carbon sequestration money, this room would be packed, and I could probably do a seminar two hours later and telling people how to do it, and it would be packed too. So these are things that I think we need to really think about, and when we talk to our politicians and so on, we need to tell the, tell the story. So what's our role in combating climate change? I believe our news is what we need to do is we need to be telling the good news to whoever we can. Tell every single person you know what we're doing on our farms and ranches. We're doing carbon sequestration work. As you build organic matter, you're taking carbon out of the atmosphere. The nutrient density of food. We spend 50% of our provincial budgets on health care. So if we start to fix that problem, that's going to save tax money. We need to be telling everyone we can that good news story. As we begin to farm regeneratively, our yields may not go up necessarily, but our profits will. And who cares about yields? I'm interested in profit. We're also going to cool the surface of the earth by keeping it greener longer. And diversity is a wonderful thing. People in the city like to go out for a drive in the beautiful scenic country and they like to see a moose or a deer or, or a lazuli bunting or a 
bobolink or whatever it is they're into, they like to see that. That won't happen unless we are farming regeneratively. Again, another ecological goods and service we're providing for free, which I think maybe we need to be rewarded for. So thank you very much. I believe we have uh, a few minutes for questions, so I'd just like to, uh, to end with this little quote right here. It says, too many plants on welfare, too many animals in prison, too many dead microbes, and too many farmers out of business. That's our current agricultural system. <coughs> so thank you. Okay, we are exactly 12 noon, which is the end, uh, official end of this uh, session. However, nothing's happening till 12.30 unless you want uh, lunch, and it's <laughs> continuously available. So I am prepared to, on behalf of the two speakers, to accept some questions, comments. So, so you're asking about how we balance the methane emissions? With cows. It, it's really a complicated problem and part of the problem is we've got a lot of ruminant livestock I don't know if we have too many or not enough but we've got them sitting atop this huge petroleum plume of methane that didn't used to exist so the bad news is if you put in all this coal methane and natural gas methane and uh, and uh, oil methane, you're going to get methane going up and cattle are going to be seen as part of that problem. <coughs> the good news is though, methane is a very short-lived greenhouse gas and there are uh, methanotrophs and there are a whole bunch of natural processes. So if we could reduce methane emissions from multiple sources by a, a, a bit, you know, 20% maybe, we could actually start to see methane concentrations in the atmosphere go down in the short term. That's not true with CO2. So I think it is the case, but I don't think that necessarily means that cattle get a pass. I think we need to think about all the methane sources and all the places that methane can be taken out of the atmosphere. Yeah, and I often hear this question, well, what about the buffalo? And it's a fascinating question and everyone should delve into it, but very briefly, there were a lot of buffalo, there are more ruminants now than there was then, but the number of buffalo that we think of was largely the result of the end of hunting that followed the smallpox epidemics of the First Nations and uh, indigenous people in North America. There was more buffalo when we started slaughtering them than there would have been hundreds of years earlier before the collapse of the North American indigenous populations. So the question of so how many buffalo were there? I've been grappling with it for 15 or 20 years, and I, I don't know. But I, I think the odds are there's probably more methane-producing ruminants on Earth now than there was, say, 500 years ago. I just have one more comment to kind of further what you're saying, Ryan. And, and, and I guess when, when you look at the, the soil where we're standing, you know, 10,000 years ago, we were covered in two miles of ice. When that ice melted, there was 0% organic matter in the soil. And the grazing system that was there from the time the ice melted till 150 years ago built some pretty rich soil. And so, you know, there was methane going out of those bison, we know that. But there was also a phenomenal amount of carbon sequestration happening by the grazing method to build that soil from zero to to 12, 14 percent, depending on where, where you are in that 9,000 or 8,000 years or whatever happened. So, you know, I think we, we, Darren and I probably don't quite agree on how livestock's role is, but, you know, the, the sequestration of carbon into grazing lands is phenomenal when you're using managed grazing. I don't agree with feedlots either. I, I think they're, that's not the answer. I think we need to get those animals out of the feedlot onto the land. Yeah, I, I think Nathan is, or Ryan is coming from a uh, cattle background, so you want to defend the industry, and so do I, and so do you. We need to be realistic, but I also think we need to look at the big picture in, you know, 
what do cattle contribute in spite of the methane that they produce? So there, there's probably, we need to look at the balance, right? Okay, another question or comment? So cattle on the, on the land is different than cattle in a feedlot. That, that, yeah. that was my take. Yeah. Can I just say something that'll make me very unpopular? <laughs> I, I, I come out of the background of the National Farmers Union, and, and we all knew that cattle in feedlots, that was bad. But I've spent the last dozen years researching climate change and emissions, and, and I, I wish the data were different. It's cattle on grass that produce methane. Cattle in feedlots eating grain don't so much, because it is it is the great miracle of cattle that they can digest grass. But part of the digestion process in that anaerobic process is they produce methane. And when you take them off of grass and put them on grain, per day, per pound of weight gain, etc., the methane actually goes down. So I'm as sad about that as you are. <laughs> but it isn't the case that feedlot cattle produce methane and grass cattle don't, it's sort of the other way around. Okay. I, I'm not happy with that. All right, another question or comment? <laughs>